Hi, for all of those who are joining us online, uh, we're experiencing a little audio difficulty with our speakers. We will be, um, uh, please bear with us just momentarily. We will be joining uh, the conference audio in just, just a moment. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I apologize for the audio difficulty that we have experienced, but we think we have it under control now. And I'm going to just jump back in where I left off and tell you a little bit about the, um, the history of the standard um, and why ISO moved into this area now. This, as I said earlier, is a bit of a departure for ISO uh, because this area of anti-bribery uh, management is, of course, much more qualitative than many of the standards that ISO is known for in the health and safety area, quality, environment, and so on. Uh, the impetus for the standard was actually the publication of a similar British standard on anti-bribery management systems that was keyed very closely to uh, the UK Bribery Act. And that standard has been um, in use now for several years and has enjoyed um, some success in the marketplace. And so when ISO uh, saw that and went to its member bodies to see if there was an appetite in various countries um, for this global standard, the answer came back yes. And so what that meant was there was some appetite in the business community in each country for a global standard. And so they were off and running. Um, Part of the issue, uh, I think, for many of these uh, global groups, technical advisory groups that were part of the development of the standard, was that there was no uh, global standard, that um, much of the guidance comes from the US, UK, and rightly or wrongly was perceived to be quite US-centric, quite Europe-centric, and many companies and other markets just weren't looking to the guidance that was available to help them develop and implement um, their programs. So the idea was to design something that could be used by companies of all sizes, across all geographies, um, to help them develop programs they were starting from a relatively immature perspective, or to benchmark their program if they were um, already implementing a fairly sophisticated program. And then finally, to provide companies with an option of third-party certification. And that's important to note about this standard. It is a requirement standard, which means that in addition to just using it as benchmark guidance, companies can actually go into the market and seek third-party certification to conformance with the standard, which um, many, I think, in the, in the community felt would be a competitive differentiator, would be actually some tangible demonstration that companies were committed to responsible business practices. And so that, that's sort of the, the history and the purpose of the standard. Um, the other thing I think that's important to note about this standard is the way in which it was developed. Um, the US was one of 56 country delegations that were part of the standard development. Um, and each of those delegations, in turn, was made up primarily of business folks. So people from companies, both large and small. Some delegations had, of course, other auditors, um, consultants, lawyers. Some country delegations actually included government representation as well. Um, and those 56 delegations came from countries as diverse as China, Mexico, Brazil, Nigeria, Kenya, South Africa, Israel, really the entire globe was, um, and each region of the globe was represented um, on a delegation that was part of the development of the standard. And so that sort of uh, sets it apart a little bit as well. Uh, in terms of Key requirements, we'll spend a minute on this. 
Um, as you would expect, the standard is actually based on um, existing guidance. So from the U.S. and the U.K., uh, from the OECD and the World Bank, we also looked at what's happening in Brazil and Spain and elsewhere. And it builds on that guidance. But it's not really different from um, what you would expect to see in terms of leading practices in this area. So uh, the requirements are keyed on a risk assessment. And in that way, we built in some flexibility for companies instead of having rigid requirements all of the requirements to build on a company's assessment at its own risk. But then it goes on to require the kinds of things you would expect to see in terms of policies, procedures, and controls. Um, it's very, the standard is very detailed in terms of what the governing body or the board of directors and top management should do in implementing the program. So those, those roles are very uh, clearly defined, as is the uh, compliance function role itself. Um, it includes requirements around communication and training, of course, due diligence on projects and business associates, and also of employees of the company as well when they're hired or when they are appointed into positions of some authority that might have an effect on the company's anti-bribery performance. It requires um, investigation procedures, you know, monitoring and review, and corrective action and continual improvement. So again, not really a departure from the kind of um, guidance that we've seen before, but I think um, in terms of detail, it's a little bit different. The standard itself is about 25 pages of requirements, and then there's some implementing guidance that is, was developed to help companies as they try to implement these requirements. So, that's a little bit of an overview of the standard itself. And I think, you know, what we wanted to do now was really move into um, our expert panel discussion about um, the standard and, and what some of their perspectives are. So I thought I would lead off and ask Sarah to sort of tell us from, you know, a Hershey perspective um, what are your perceptions of the standard, and how how might you at her at her you? Thank you, Leslie. Um, so the standard, I I do think, has a lot of opportunities for a company as well as cha challenges. As the co as our compliance program continues to mature, I see at least in the short term leveraging the standard as a benchmarking measure. Um, it allows us to look across the enterprise at uh, key components of our operations where we can ramp up clients, processes, and programs given strategic initiatives. Um, I think some of the challenges that could potentially affect a company, one is, is the impact on privilege um, as we go through um, a potential audit or assessment, I, I think companies will open up their program uh, and would expose certain privileged information. And then also I see a potential challenge with third parties, um, whether or not a company decides to require key business partners, um, external partners to certify could potentially impact uh, that relationship going forward. I think overall, looking at the standard, um, there are definitely more opportunities than challenges. Um, I do like the fact that it's not a one-size-fits-all. It allows companies to take a risk-appropriate approach to it and look at the industry in which you operate, um, your operating model, and, and make certain decisions um, with respect to the standard based on that. And thanks. Let's let's turn now to Stephen for some uh, general observations. Stephen, press up pound one on your phone, um, and then one, if you're listening. Maybe while Stephen is. Um, Go ahead, Leslie. 
Um, All right. Well, hopefully this is better. Up. Yeah, there you go, Stephen. Thank, there you go. thank you. Yep. Perfect. So one, I think it's very helpful for us because I work for a variety of engineers and, and they intuitively understand an ISO certification versus other compliance certifications or, or, or benchmarking that we may be conducting. What we also find helpful is, again, as Sarah highlighted, I think it really emphasizes where do we stand, what do we need to improve on. It's, it's a useful checklist. It's a useful way to say, wait a minute, do we, do we, are we meeting the standards that, that have been set out? I think it's a very useful tool to work with people throughout our company to say, here's what we're trying to achieve and here's why we're doing it. Uh, but I think one of the concerns we have right now is really the mechanics. Uh, understanding, the, going to leadership saying it's going to take us this amount of money, it's going to involve this process, there, there's a lot of uncertainty and as that gets fleshed out, that will be really helpful. Uh, you know, I, I understand a lot of folks complain and highlight, well, this isn't a silver bullet, but I think the standard, you know, there, there isn't anything that, out there that is, and it's another uh, tool that we can use in our arsenal to highlight and make sure our program is where it should be. Thank you. Thank you for those perspectives. And I think maybe we'll turn now to Manny. And, you know, as um, someone who's been in this forensic auditing business um, and with the experience that you have, you know, what do you think about some of those practical issues that Stephen raised and also the, the privilege issue that, that Sarah raised? Okay. Well, well, thank you for that. And, and I guess trying to unbundle it a, a little bit. So putting on a forensic lens for just a second, you know, one of the things that is defined within the standard is this concept around effectiveness. You have to have uh, anti-bribery controls in place and working effectively. And quite honestly, one of the judgment areas that will come into play for whoever decides to be a certifier is how does one gauge effectiveness to the standards definition where it says that the planned activities must be realized and achieved according to planned results. And that's fairly broad in terms of what it, what it means. There's a number enumerations within the standard itself where it calls the certifier to look at effectiveness. And quite honestly, that will be based on the certifier's judgment as to what is and what is not effective. There's no real guidance at this early juncture of how to do that. So one of the difficulties could be is if you're looking to have a company or potentially a third party be certified under the standard, you know, how does one calibrate the proper sample size selections that will be necessary that provides a, a, a let's say, a result will you be able to say that the program is working effectively. So there's a practical end to this in that if you're a large company, you know, getting a certification, uh, putting aside privilege for just one second around just the tactics of getting there around the testing that needs to occur could be quite extensive. It could take a long period of time, but also, and I think Steve touched this on, on a little bit, it could cost a lot of money. So. The pros and cons of ultimately deciding to certify, to get a certification or not, um, I think is something that needs to be carefully evaluated. The other sort of gating question, it's almost like um, you know, akin to the audit services, if you will. Once you start down the road of getting an audit opinion, in this case getting an ISO certification, if you decide not to get a certification in any particular year and say, geez, our CEO came in, and thought it was just too expensive for us to spend all this money on an ISO certification. And it's back to the points that Sarah and Stephen had raised around privilege. You know, I'm not going to be certified next year just because I want to save some money. And quite honestly, from a legal perspective, it's just a safer course of action. I would say, you know, once you go down the road that you want certifications, I think you're locked in because the expectation in the market will be that you're ISO certified and if you abruptly stop that in any particular year, people could unfortunately come to the conclusion saying, oh my goodness, perhaps there's something wrong with that, with that whole company because they didn't get a certification or a certifier starts his or her work and then is unable to certify and then has to issue a letter 
that they were not able to certify for whatever the reasons are, and that could be problematic as well. And I think at the end of the day, you know, I'm going to come back to one of Steve's comment that it's not a silver bullet. I mean, I would, I would defer to the lawyers on the line as to whether ultimately a U.S. government regulator or enforcement agency will accept the certification as a good, as a step of good defense, if you will, good governance, if you will. I mean, those questions have not yet to been answered. So I think right now at this early stage, I'll go back to kind of Sarah's initial point, the benchmarking exercise in terms of taking a look of where you are and how it fits in, I think that's very helpful to do. I think the challenge will be is how do companies look at the word effectiveness? And I will, I will, I will put on the table that the legal definition of effectiveness is very different than a certifier's definition for effectiveness. And that will be, I believe, a, a point of tension back and forth between the stakeholders. Yeah, all really great insights. Um, and let's um, turn to Glenn before we sort of open up the dialogue just for his initial perspectives as well. Glenn? Yeah, well, thanks. I think, I think everybody's points uh, are excellent, particularly Manny's here, uh, because I think there are, as you think about the practical um, implications of certification, I think Manny lays out a good set of points you're on, you're off, you're on, you're off. Now, notwithstanding that, we have seen some, uh, mostly outside the United States, some organizations, for example, uh, the Asian Development Bank in Manila, which is an is a, uh, enforcement authority like the World Bank and the Inter-American Development Bank and the like, have been debarring companies, and just since the standard has been um, released, they have told companies that they can use the standard and get certified under the standard to be released from debarment. And so what they're doing uh, in, that, in these instances, they're not actually using a certifier, they're using a monitor to issue a monitor report that the company has fulfilled the ISO 37001 standard. So that's a, that's a little different than a certification because the monitor isn't a certifying authority, but they're taking those standards and they're using them as the monitor's um, uh, benchmark to determine whether the company should be released. Um, and then obviously they're telling the company that they have to seek certification after they get, they get off. So that, that will be interesting to see. The other thing that uh, we're hearing Again, outside of the United States, and I'm going to be, watch how this um, unfolds, is that companies intend on putting ISO standards on their supply chain to remain as eligible suppliers. And I think that's interesting, particularly if the company itself doesn't go through certification, but they flow down requirements into their supply chain as and there's also discussion with national procurement authorities to have in a national procurement, publicly funded procurement, that bidders would be, again, outside the United States, would be required to have um, these types of uh, the ISO 37001 as the standard, say, like on a big infrastructure project that's financed by the AAI, AIIB or the like. So I think while it's only a month old, and it's too early to tell, I think that you will see some uh, interesting uh, DV, uh, uses of the standards and uh, applications of it around the globe, but probably not in a uniformed way. So back to you, Leslie. Right. Thank you, Glenn. And I, I, I want to underscore what, what Glenn just said about um, the effect in other markets. Um, I have heard, for example, that Spain is considering adopting the requirements of the ISO standard um, as sort of their uh, definition of what a good compliance program should look like. If you all have been following what's been happening in Spain, you know, they, uh, the government um, passed about a year ago a law requiring companies to have compliance programs in place. 
but um, the implementing regulations have yet to be developed, and so there's still some question about what that kind of a program will look like. And so this is, uh, you know, this is another example of how the standard may actually be used, which could have um, ripple effects and, and very important ones as well. So I, I agree with what Glenn said about the effect in the market outside the United States. Um, so I, I have a question, I guess, for, for our company folks here, and I could start with Steve. Um, would, would your company be inclined to use the standard if it weren't somehow endorsed by a regulator? Or would you need that sort of um, imprimatur to, to consider the standard uh, of benefit to you? No, I, I don't think, I think certainly that is helpful and, and that helps drive when we're in a environment where we have to allocate you know, our, our budget to the most efficient use possible. But I don't think we would say, well, we're not going to do it unless there's that, that requirement. I think it's a very useful tool. Um, and, and we would certainly, depending on the cost, depending on the process that we go through as we learn more about it, we, we, we are interested in it and we'll continue to analyze it. I will tell you that if I was, it's also important to note the type of company we are, given that we're an exploration production company, uh, we don't have as many parties reaching out to us for due diligence. If I was, say, on the oil field services side or in the type of company that receives a many, many of these third-party due diligence requests, I would be a very strong advocate just from a practical standpoint of saying, look, I've addressed these issues, I've gone through this process, here's my certification, or at least here's the information, so as to try and push back on, rather than answer, you know, 100 or 200 different due diligence requests on our, on our program to say, you've got everything in one package, we'll show you what we're comfortable providing, or you've got the certification. So again, I think it really depends on where you are as a company as far as the number of third-party requests that help drive whether this will be worth it to, to the company outside of a government expectation. And Sarah, do you have anything to, to add to that? I mean, just to follow on to what Steven said, I, I don't think from our perspective we would need a regulator uh, sign on to this per se. I do think it's important to consider business impact, obviously, with respect to the standard. Um, we are on the end where we are issuing um, due diligence on our business partners as opposed to receiving it um, from from third parties. Um, I do think overall this is a very useful tool and, and referring back to just business impact, and one thing that stood out to me as I reviewed the standard overall is just the language around how it describes the various principles for an effective anti-corruption compliance program. I think that the, the language that's used, the way it's set, set up, will definitely help us as compliance professionals communicating to our business, internal business partners the importance to do this if it was something that we decided to sign on to in the future. Um, another question that I have, and, and maybe I'll, I'll ask Manny this one, um, and I'll give a little context to the question. You know, as, as we were developing the standard, you know, we had our, as our mandate to, to draft a standard that would be um, useful to small and large companies alike across industries. And you know, we tried to build in some um, flexibility in the standard. So for example, as I mentioned earlier, the re requirements are keyed really off the, the company's risk assessment, which is really the linchpin of, of the standard, but of course any, any effective compliance program. And we also built in this concept of reasonable and proportionate implementation so that the requirements are to be implemented in a way that is reasonable and proportionate to the company. So my question is, do you think we hit the right note? Do you think this standard can be used by small and large companies alike? Um, and finally, do you think that sort of reasonable and proportionate language is helpful, or does it add more confusion to what may already be a confused area? Uh, well, let, let, me, let me try. First of all, I do agree uh, with your premise that it does provide you an ability to uh, address your risk assessment and, and design and implement and put your program in place based on that outcome. One of the statements that I thought was very helpful in the standard uh, 
uh, specifically is that, you know, at the end of the day, the standard can provide no assurance that bribery will not occur. In other words, you can't completely eliminate the risk of bribery occurring within any company. What the standard is asking you to do, and this goes back, Leslie, uh, right on to your point, as long as you can put in a reasonable and proportionate measure around your anti-corruption uh, management system and your program and be able to demonstrate that you've reacted and responded to the outcomes from the risk assessment, uh, noting that you have the resources and the money uh, available to putting it reasonably, not absolutely. I think that's very, very helpful uh, from that perspective. And I, and I think the other thing that this will bring into more focus is, you know, the, the risk assessment is not just a perfunctory sort of exercise. If someone were to read through the guidance that's provided in the standards, I think there's plenty of opportunity for the risk assessments, quite honestly, to be a little bit more robust, perhaps, that they've been in the past. So that way you can show your, your methodologies and your thinking and your documented trail to say, here are the various inputs into our risk assessment, and, and quite honestly, the architecture of the ISO standard enables you to literally to map the inputs that go into the risk assessment. Here's the outcome from that risk assessment, and here's how we manage it you know, throughout the year. Um, I think that will quite honestly lay out a fairly good story for yourself. So I would work under the premise that you know, it's a good roadmap. The risk assessment becomes foundational to the success of whether or not your program is ultimately determined to be reasonable. Um, and the other thing that caught my eye here from this perspective, and I just want to share that with others here on the call, is that it's, just, it's much more expansive than just public uh, companies. It includes private companies and not-for-profits. So I think the standard has far-reaching ramifications on the international business spectrum as to what would be a reasonable program for anti-corruption. Uh, that, that's, that's a very important point, and, and I'll, I'll just follow up on that to say, and I should have mentioned it, I think my, the audio dif difficulties kind of threw me off my game for a second, um, but I should have mentioned that the standard, um, not only is it applicable to the various types of organizations that Manny has outlined, but it um, includes requirements that uh, address both bribery of public officials, but also commercial bribery as well. So um, it's a little bit broad in that sense. It doesn't actually address um, all types of corruption. It really is only focused on bribery. It doesn't get into fraud and, uh, and sort of other things. But it is broad in that it covers both you know, foreign bribery and commercial bribery. And it also involves both bribery by the company and bribery of the company, so inbound bribery in the, in the company procurement context, for example. So it's quite broad and applicable to a, a variety of types of organizations as well as sizes of organizations. So that's important to note. Thank you for reminding me of that, Manny. And Glenn, I thought I'd ask you, I know you've worked on a lot of um, third-party programs uh, you know, in your role at PwC. Um, what do you, how do you see the pros and cons of using the standard as a yardstick to, to measure your third parties or, or requiring them to have the certification? If you can talk us through that. Well, there's certainly some that having something in place that allows, allows you to get some higher level of confidence, say it's part of your diligence process and you find out that the suppliers have that, now, there are a lot of variables, and one thing that I've been getting asked a lot, and I think Manny's been getting asked this too, and maybe I'll a answer the question with a little bit of a question at the end, but, you know, who are, the, who are going to be the certifiers? And, there's, and ISO has a many, many different standards, and there's a lot of different ISO certifiers, and I've seen ISO certifications of big programs where the ISO certifiers are kind of general, and they run around certifying every, everything. So I'd like to hear about... Leslie, your view on the certification standards, which are an annex to the document. But I, I think that on, if, I w if I was doing due diligence on a third party and I came across that they were publicly ISO certified, that obviously would be, that would be predominantly, that would be reported 
as a, as a significant finding of the due diligence report that we, if we were doing it for a client, we would highlight that in the, kind of on our executive findings as a top, top of the line finding that they've been certified and we'd articulate what it says. So I, I think it's, I think it's, I think it's a, a really good thing. I think it, but I think in the long term it brings into the same questions that Manny uh, brought up. What happens if they went through certification two, three, four years, and they said, hey, we're just not going to do it anymore. It costs too much. And all of a sudden we see that they're not certified. In a, and uh, we say, oop, they're not certified now, and they were certified last year. That's going to be reported as a potential red flag when it really is just a budgetary issue. So I think there are all kinds of um, pros to it. But again, if you're going to go down the road of certification, I think you should be briefing your CFO and your, your CEO and the chief compliance officer that it's a long-term commitment and you can't jump in and jump out of it, if, uh, if you will. But Leslie, over to you on the cert, like who are going to be the assessors? I know you're working on that. Who are these people that are going to be checking our clients out? Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll jump right into that. But I, I did just want to um, agree with something that Glenn said. As we, as we were developing the standard, you know, we, we hope that it will be useful for companies to get certification and it will be meaningful to them. But I think we all agree that it's still just a, a part of the due diligence process and, you know, companies will still have to um, undertake effective due diligence and, and monitor their third parties as they, as they go along. Um, so, but jumping into certification, um, th this was one of the really big issues, actually, for all of us. You know, we were all independent experts, us from the United States, but also uh, from uh, the other delegations. None of us had any affiliation with ISO. We're all anti-bribery experts. And so one of the things that we were very concerned about is that the people who were doing the certification were also anti-bribery experts. But just a little bit about the process. Um, of course, it's voluntary, but as we've heard, if, you know, it's adopted by certain, you know, governments or, or MDBs. Um, that makes it a, a little different. But generally speaking, it's a voluntary standard. It looks just like an audit. There's usually a questionnaire that each individual auditor will develop. I mean, ISO doesn't have sort of a, an audit questionnaire. Getting back to something that Manny had said, you know, some of the practicalities of how this is going to work really are uh, still to be fleshed out and will depend on the auditor that you choose. Um, of course, you will have to uh, produce documentary evidence to show that each of the requirements has been met. And so for any of you who have looked at the standard, documentation is a really key uh, issue. Um, almost every requirement has a documentary evidence uh, add-on requirement to it. Uh, there will be an on-site audit with interviews. Um, presumably, you can have a dialogue back and forth with your auditor. And once the, if there are no um, major nonconformities, um, a company can be certified. And that certification is usually valid for a period of two to three years. What is a major uh, nonconformity? Um, you know, if you don't have a document, but you have got a process, but you, that's probably um, minor, it could rise to the level of major. That's another area that's yet to be fleshed out. And so we'll have to wait and see how that goes. Um, but on the competency issue, ISO auditors are generally um, regulated by one very general auditor competency requirement that we, as we were developing the standard, felt was insufficient for this area. So as in a parallel process, we went through um, several years of developing competency requirements for this standard in particular, which require the auditor to be able to show that they have an understanding of anti-bribery laws. And of course, we're you know, talking about more than just the FCPA or the UK Bribery Act that might apply to any one company. So any one company could be you know, subject to a number of laws, and, and the auditor would have to understand that. They would have to have specific knowledge of um, what a good program looks like, um, how to implement financial and non-financial controls, um, how to recognize red flags. 
of corruption, you know, how to do a proper risk assessment and due diligence. And so really, basically, we're requiring them to be expert in each of the areas that the standard covers, which you know, I hope everybody agrees is the, is the right way to go. Um, the way this works is that in each country, um, the standard member body has an accreditation arm. And that arm will accredit people or companies to certify to the ISO standard, which is another reason that it's going to be a little while before certification becomes a reality, because anyone now who wants to do this work will need to go through their own process of showing that they meet these auditor competency requirements. And so what I've heard over the last um, little bit is that in the US, um, we expect that um, certification will probably be ready by about the January, February timeframe. There are apparently lots of uh, companies that are interested in getting into this line of work. And they're you know, right now going through the process of, of you know, showing that they meet these requirements. So um, maybe by the beginning of next year, this will become a reality for companies who want to do it. I should also say that uh, you're not limited by geography in terms of who you go to to be your auditor. You could be a company in the US and go to a UK auditor or vice versa. So uh, in some ways, there's sort of a race to, uh, among the, these certifiers to, be, you know, to get out there in the market and, and get going because um, you know, companies who really want to be first movers can can get started right away with them. So that's sort of how um, certification is going to work. And we've had a couple of questions from the audience that I, I guess I could go ahead and um, inject unless anybody wants to comment on that certification process. Okay. Well, one of those questions is, um, what does the DOJ and the SEC think about this, and have they made um, any public comments about the standard? And I, I can give my perspective, and then I'll, I'll see if any of you all have anything to add. So one of the things that we did as we were developing the standard is make sure that we were talking to the DOJ and the SEC, and also um, the Commerce Department. Um, for the, you know, as we went along, just to keep them abreast of, of what was going on. And of course, uh, I cannot speak for them and wouldn't, wouldn't try to do so. I think they were very interested that this process was ongoing, um, you know, optimistic that it would be a good process with industry input, that that was uh, you know, important to have industry at the table developing the standard, um, but certainly wouldn't go so far as to um, endorse the standard or, or give any um, sort of indication of, of how they felt about its strengths or weaknesses. Um, I've heard in recent um, public remarks um, the DOJ say that certification is very interesting, but they couldn't rely on a, you know, a sort of certification before the fact um, that they're still going to look to see if companies are designing comprehensive program, programs, implementing them in good faith, and testing them quite regularly to sh ensure that they're effective. So I think that, that's what I've heard from the regulators. Do, does anybody else on the panel have, have anything else to add to that? Hey, uh, Leslie, it's Manny. One of, the, uh, one of the reasons for their enthusiasm could be you could see a large spike in voluntary disclosures as certifiers come through and they start evaluating the program they start coming through, you know, what I'm going to call, you know, deviations or deficiencies that may ultimately end up having to put the company in the quandary of, of whether or not having to do a voluntary disclosure. So from a certain perspective, think about this. If they've deputized a thousand certifiers across the globe to go into corporate America, I mean, they're going to be sitting there with arms wide open. Right. Particularly, particularly also, Manny, that there's no the privilege issue. A lot of uh, when you do any anti-corruption anti program assessments, a lot of it is done under privilege, so you can determine if you have vulnerabilities and and the like. But when you have a, a third-party certifier, you're not going to get the 
benefit of the privilege and all this information is going to get into the hands of a certifier and the, you know what happens if there is an issue in the company is the certifier going to get subpoenaed and all that information going to come out yeah. i think it's i mean Glenn, Glenn, you're you're exactly right. And and the other the other question on the table goes back to whether you know DOJ and the SEC look at internal controls fairly you know differently, commonly but differently, differently in that the SEC has a strict liability standard over whether or not an internal control quote was operating effectively. So you could have a program certifier that comes through and says, "Geez, we just found." some minor observations, and Glenn, to your point, non-privileged, you can't hide behind it because it's all out there, and the SEC, well, thank you very much. Look, we have 52 instances globally where it didn't work as planned, so notwithstanding the certifier's point of view, you know, we think we have an SEC case that we may want to consider pursuing, even though the DOJ will stand down because you do have an anti-corruption program in place. So I just use this a little bit, Glenn, and I fully agree with you, sort of kind of put the conversation out there that this one's going to, you know, require a little bit more time because it's going to get complicated, right? And it goes back to Leslie's point. You can't allow regular auditors to make opinions on the anti-bribery systems here. You really need experienced, certified people that know what they're looking at to really have qualified judgments come into play. This is not a cookbook approach. Which is why I think you, the most of the excitement around uh, the ISO standard is in the foreign environment. This is, the most of the interest that I've heard is not the is exactly what uh, Sarah in the U.S. is what Sarah and Stephen are saying. Oh, it's a good benchmark. The outside of the U.S. that doesn't have these SEC rules, you he you hear more. I think momentum for implementation. Maybe that's a coincidence, but that's that that to me aligns with these concerns in the U.S. We have another question for our company folks, so I guess I could uh, turn to Stephen and then Sarah. Is there anything in the standard that surprised you? I wouldn't say surprise. I mean, there's nothing that you say, wait a minute, what about that? I, I, I think it is very helpful. Um, I wouldn't say, you know, we'd say, okay, we must meet every single detail that's in the, uh, that is in there as far as, what we need to accomplish, but I, I think it's all it's all out there in one way or the other. I think this is probably one of the best ways it's been organized of, of all the resources and all the guidance that's out there. But I, I think if you look around, you'd, you'd find there's nothing you'd say, wow, I've never seen that before. I haven't heard that before. I just think how it's organized and how it's structured is is probably one of the, the, the best ways that I've seen out there. Yeah, and I agree with Stephen uh, just said. There were no surprises as I reviewed the standard. I think certain components are pretty prescriptive, which isn't necessarily a bad thing um, because there's still room to take that risk-based approach based on your operating model and, and the industry. Um, but yeah, I, I agree. You know, the language itself um, for the standard is very you know, business friendly, as I mentioned earlier, very well organized, but no, nothing stood out to me as a, as a surprise. And, and I think another question that um, our company folks could answer, so if you're, a, if you're a large company, if you're a big multinational and you are interested in seeking certification, um, how, how would you go about that? Would you do it on a, a subsidiary level first, a business unit, a headquarters? And I should say that the standard is flexible enough that you can do that. A part of an organization can be certified. Not, you don't have, the entire organization doesn't have to go through the certification. So from a big company perspective, um, how, how would you think companies would start if they are going to go down this route? Maybe Sarah? That's a, actually really good, a really good question. I mean, at, le at least in our case, our anti-bribery and, and compliance principles are uh, are cascaded globally across all of our business units. Um, so I I think in the first instance we would look at it holistically. You know, perhaps um, the the large bucket items um, and principles that you know make up the the standard, and then maybe from there focus on some of our uh, more 
specific and discrete business units that are operating outside of the U.S.? What about and, you, Stephen? Do you have any different to add? Sure. So, I mean, we would probably, every company is going to be different in the sense of how, what their real operating entities are. I mean, we would, of course, apply it as broadly as possible. Um, you know, I'm the parent of four-year-old twins, so I'm very familiar with the do as I say, not as I, as I do approach. So I would be, uh, I I'd probably be a bit suspicious if I saw, or I'd want a really good explanation if someone said, oh, this, this audit just, or I'm sorry, this certification just applies to this entity. Even though we're just contracting with that entity, I would really want to understand, okay, so why not these other entities or what am I missing? So I, it's, it's a tough question for, uh, for companies to address. I would think pr from a practical term, we would, we would do it to the highest level operating entity just to, to have it apply across the company. I can see some benefits of having it targeted to a specific entity. But again, if I'm looking at it as the person who's looking at a, a vendor who's, who's highlighting their certification, I'll probably be a bit suspicious if, it's just tar if that certification is just to a specific entity and not to the larger corporate structure. Okay. Um, we have another question um, from somebody who has, has really read the uh, standard in, in great detail um, and notes that many of the requirements are keyed off of the company's finding of more than a low bribery risk. And so the question is, uh, lots of companies today um, do enhanced due diligence on high-risk parties. Um, will this standard change what companies have to do in that regard? Maybe Glenn, do you want to take that one? Can you, can you say that again, Leslie? Well, I think that the person is just noting that many companies um, do enhanced due diligence or uh, apply in enhanced controls when they have a finding, when they have found in their own risk assessment uh, right. a high risk. And the standard right. um, is the requirements are actually keyed off of a finding of more than a low risk. And so the question is, how is that going to change what companies have to do today? From a due diligence perspective. Right, yeah. No, I mean, look, we're, the, the, if you're doing a due, it, there's a couple of things here, right? To the extent that a due diligence provider is looking at an entity and they can actually see all that, depends on how much access to all the information that they have. If they, if they can't get access to it, they're going to have to rely on secondary sources. They're going to report what they can have to report. But if they're, if they're in looking at this issue, um, and what they're going to do, uh, like Manny would, they're going to drill into it, right? They're going to try to figure out the underlying um, basis for it, and they're going to report it out independent of the ISO process. So um, this is just another issue to me that ISO raises, right? It's going to create a corpus or a body of information from which due diligence providers can go and look at to make more substantive judgments about the company's, let's say, health and status in the anti-corruption area. Because if we know that it's out there, I know Manny was going to, we're not going to, if we're doing due diligence, it's like a bot, we're doing it for the buyer of a company and we're asked to, or, or the, uh, and we're asked to look at the, um, comp, the, um, the seller, we're going to go in and ask for all that information, have it put up in a data room so that we can look at it. Hey, hey, Glenn, uh, let me just add one, one uh, perspective to that and build it in. Leslie, I, I want to come back to a comment you said. A lot of folks are doing risk assessments today around international risk, but the standard applies to commercial bribery. And I would offer that to pass that standard of commercial bribery broadly defined, you, you better start doing risk assessments around domestic potential risk situations as well so it needs to come at it at both sides because one of the one of the interesting points within the standards and it's within the definition of business associate on page five it added clients and customers to the risk yeah. assessment from a due yeah. diligence perspective and just think about having Glenn having to cover that both domestically and internationally that to me sounds quite expansive and it's it's just it's the the population set is 
almost unmanageable. I mean, imagine Hershey's on the phone if they have to consider their customers. That's every person on the planet <laughs> that eats a Hershey's Kiss, right? I mean, yeah. that's, you don't want that, right, Sarah? No, no. <laughs> I want a lot of people eating Hershey Kisses, but. <laughs> but it would seem, you well, know, Glenn, to your point, and, and just one of the key themes that seems to go throughout this is it's really going to be key for whoever goes through this process on who is that certifier that they use both internally to make sure that they understand and have a practical business sense of, of how the operations are run, what are the true risks, to also be credible with third parties so they say, okay, you know, this certifier did it, I, I more trust in their judgment than some company I've never heard being able to go through and, and be able to look at the standard and say, okay, we understand this says this, but this is how we're, we're, we're going to interpret it in a, in a commercially reasonable way. To me, it's just another, to your point, Glenn, it's just another great example of it's going to be crucial on who is the certifier that you use, both internally and externally for this process. Do you know that I, I'm sure you, everybody's getting asked this in the service community. I know Manny and I, we were talking about it last week. There's like, should we, should we get certified? Should we get certified? And I've heard some companies say, we want to be the first certified company in this industry. And, I, and if, if you just listen to what was said on this, on this uh, webinar today I'm, and, and what we've told our clients is, why go first? There's so many twists and turns and lessons that are going to be learned by companies. Why why do you want to be the first in industry to do this and be the guinea pig, so to speak? So my sense is that we, what, that you let, let it mature and see how it plays out and see how it evolves before you jump in and be the first entity to be certified. Manny, do, what do you think? No, I, I think I think you're right, and, and Glenn, it comes back. I, I want to say Sarah early on had sort of the balancing act of the business needs, the business requirements versus the legal strategy, and I think that's the frame that companies need to carefully consider because I believe once you say you're going to get into the pool and you're going to start swimming, I, I don't think you can get out of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well. Um, that's a good note to end on. Um, thank you all for this really informative dialogue. Um, and thank you on, on the call for sticking with us even through our technical difficulties. We really appreciate it and hope that you will join us for our next webinar. Um, of course, if any of you have any questions at all about any of the information that you've heard today, um, We'll make these slides available, and all of our contact information is included on the last slide in the presentation, so don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you so much, and have a great day. Thank you.